Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Sagrada Artisans, designed by Adrian Adamescu and Daryl Andrews, and published by Floodgate Games, who helped sponsor this video. Here, rival families will compete to make the most significant contributions to the Sagrada Familia Cathedral's beautiful stained glass windows, and you'll do this over the course of several games that make up an ongoing campaign. Over time, you'll be given new rules, new components, and you'll even sticker and write on the components themselves, making permanent changes. After the 10th game, the campaign will end and you'll crown a final winner. However, the game can still be played beyond that point using the included booster pack, which we'll discuss later. In this video, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know to play your first game, except for a couple of surprises that I'll save for you to discover. And I won't spoil anything beyond that. The rest you'll discover as you go. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, give each player one of these journals. They're all identical, and when you gain yours, open it to the inside cover. Here you'll choose a family name and record it in this space on your inside front cover. Your family will persist over four generations or ages, so record a chosen name for the first age in the space here. And keep in mind, each player will use their chosen journal over the course of the entire campaign. That said, don't look ahead in your journal until you're instructed to, because your journal will contain surprises that you'll discover as you play. Now set this cathedral board in the center of the play area, along with the 10 dice and this bag. Also set the included colored pencils nearby, which you can keep sharpened with the included sharpener. For your first game, select a starting player at random, and then give them the pencil sharpener as a reminder. In the game box, you'll find several envelopes and boxes. Don't open any of these until you're instructed to, and right now, I'm going to instruct you to open this one. This is the main deck box. Open and draw the green card found at the front. This will remind you to never shuffle this deck and that the cards you need for the current game will be labeled at the top. We're playing game one, so we use the cards with a one at the top, drawing this one known as the intro, which you now flip over. Now have this story text read aloud, where you'll learn that the master architect has brought you and the other families together to work on the great stained glass windows for his cathedral. You then resolve any of the action steps found at the bottom, and in this case, we're simply told to play window one. This means you turn pages in your journal until you come to that numbered window, which is right here. You'll find story text at the top to read, along with the special rules for this scenario. For example, this reminds us that any unique rules for this game will be located here, and then we're told to collect the five private objectives from the main deck, which will show this back. We give them a shuffle, and then deal one face down to each player. We'll assume we have three players in this video, and return any leftovers unseen to the back of the deck box. Never throw anything out, because it might end up being used later. Now, you can always examine your own private objective, but keep it a secret from the other players. And any other cards with a one at the top are left in the main deck box for now. And that's the setup. In Sagrada Artisans, you and the other players will be coloring in spaces on your window panes, which will score you points at the end of the game. Scoring the most points adds to your family's legacy. Accumulate the most legacy, and you'll win the campaign. But first, we need to learn how to play individual games, and each game is played over 12 rounds, and each round begins with the round setup. Here, the starting player puts all of the dice into the dice bag and gives them a good mix, drawing out a number of them equal to twice the number of players plus one. So in this three-player game, that means we draw out seven dice. The dice you draw out are rolled, and each die is assigned to their matching spaces on this cathedral board. For the sake of this example, let's assume these were the values that were rolled. This green one die would go here, this blue three would go here, and so on. Each space can only hold one die, so if you have duplicate results, re-roll any extra copies until every die is unique and assigned to its own space. Now beginning with the starting player and going clockwise once around the table, each player takes a single turn. And once everyone has had a turn, the last player to go then takes a second turn right away, and going counterclockwise from them, so does everyone else. So with that understood, let's go through how a turn works. On your turn, you must select any one die from the cathedral board, and without changing its value, set it beside your journal. The game calls this drafting a die. You then select any valid space within your window to fill with that die's color and value. 
We'll learn the full rules for what makes a space valid, but for now, let's say I picked this spot. With the included black pencil, you now write that number into the space. So I've written a five. Then with the pencil that matches that die's color, you shade in the space like I'm doing here so that it looks something like this when you're done. I'm actually gonna be filling these into extra sheets that I borrowed from the publisher. I have multiple copies so I can create several examples as necessary without marking up one of the actual journals that I wouldn't be as easily able to erase if I made a mistake or just wanted to show a different type of example. I'm also saving these for when I play the game myself. Just know the very first space that you fill in can be anywhere in your window, but after that, there are some rules you must follow. Each die you collect on future turns must be filled into a space adjacent to any space that you've already filled in on your window. And to be adjacent, the space must either share a full edge or touch on the corner. So the next die I draft could potentially be used to fill in any of these spaces around it. You'll notice that some spaces have pre-printed colors or numbers, but these spots are not considered to be filled in yet. Only once you add a number or color to a space is a spot considered filled. And we'll see how these spaces get filled in in just a moment. The important thing I want you to understand right now is that you may never fill in two spaces that share an edge with the same color or value. So for example, now that this purple five is filled in here, I couldn't use a die to fill in this space with either a purple or a five, since these two spaces share a full edge. If two spaces only share a corner, then they can have the same value and or color. So I could put this red five here, or if I'd collected this purple two, again, remember, it could not go here because it has the same color as a space sharing its full edge. I could, however, assign a purple die to this space. And remember, I said spaces with pre-printed colors or values are not considered filled in yet. So even though this space has a pre-printed four, a four I collect on a die could be assigned to this space, which shares an edge with it, because this four hasn't been filled in. You can think of it as being empty, effectively. But with that in mind, let's explain how these spaces work. Any space with a pre-printed value or color is a restriction. This means the only die that can be used to fill in its space must either have the matching value or color that it shows. For example, if I had collected this green four, I couldn't use it here because the die I use for this space must be blue. I could use a die like this, and then into this space, I just write a four. For a space like this, I could use a green two, and then I would just shade this space in with the green pencil. With the restrictions understood, be sure you don't intentionally or accidentally break them. But of course, accidents can happen. If you or another player discover a space has been accidentally filled in that breaks a placement rule, for example, I filled in a five here next to another five, then you immediately mark an X through that space with the black pencil. This is considered a broken window and you'll lose a point for it during scoring. You now treat this space as if it has no color or value. You can't refill it in later, but it no longer causes any restrictions to spaces that share an edge with it. For example, although this had a five written into it, it no longer stops me from putting a five here or here. So to summarize, when you use a die to fill in a space, your very first die of the game can fill in any space of your window following any pre-printed restrictions if you pick one of those spaces. As explained earlier, all dice drafted after that must go into a space sharing either a full edge or corner with a space that you've already filled in. And squares that do share a full edge can never have the same value or same color. And make sure you also obey any restrictions of the pre-printed spaces. Now after filling in a space, you keep the die that you drafted and then the next player goes and they draft a die. Now keep in mind, you must always take a die on your turn, even if you don't have a valid space to use it. If you end up with a die you can't use, you keep the die, but don't fill in any spaces. Now, with that understood, you might be wondering, why are you filling these spaces in in the first place? In the center of this sheet, you'll find three public objectives that every player can score points from at the end of the game. 
For example, this says that you'll score four points per column in your window that shows all different values. Now, we won't go through each of the public objectives because how they work is printed on them, but you'll want to pay attention to these while playing. Also, don't forget you have a private objective. At the end of the game, you'll score three points, as it says here, for every space in your window that shows the indicated color, red in this case. So I might want to draft red dice when I can. To help you use your dice even more effectively, you also have access to tools that can manipulate a die you've taken on your turn. Every player has access to the same tools, and they're printed here in your journal. During a turn, you may use as many tools as you want, even the same one multiple times, resolving their printed effects, which are shown here at the bottom. For example, this one says that you can flip the die you've drafted. So if I had drafted this die on my turn, I could use this tool to assume its value is the one showing on the opposite side. In other words, I would treat this as a blue 5. Now, the effect doesn't change the die itself. You just treat the die as the new result. And you can chain several effects together. If I had another tool that would increase the value of a die by one, I could use that as well to turn the blue five that I'm treating this as into a blue six. Abilities that can increase or decrease the value of a die will actually be introduced later in the campaign. But I'm just bringing this up now so you're aware. And these effects can even cause a die's value to be less than one or greater than six. If you drafted a die that had a value of six and used an ability that increased it by one, it would now be considered a die with a value of seven that you'd be able to mark into your window. Just be aware, if an effect is causing a die to currently be valued at zero or higher than six, and then you apply a flip effect to it, that always changes the value to zero. Also note, abilities that treat a die as a new value or color only last until the end of the player's turn. At that point, the die is just treated as the color and value it's actually showing. Either way, after using a tool, you mark off one of these symbols above it. And once a tool's symbols have all been marked off, you can't use that particular tool again during this game. With that, you now know the general rules of play. After going clockwise around the table once with every player drafting a die, the last player then goes again and you take turns in reverse order back around the table drafting one more die so that each player will now have two dice. And at that point, it's time to resolve the end of the round. Here, each player marks off the next number on the round track of their journal here, so the one in this case. If this had been the end of the 12th round, you'd now resolve the end of the game. Otherwise, the player with the pencil sharpener now passes it to the left, and that player becomes the first player for the next round. They'll gather up all the dice from wherever they are and mix them up back in the bag, drawing out the related number of dice for your number of players, adding them to the cathedral, re-rolling any duplicates, and then they start a new round of turns. While playing, you'll want to keep an eye out for special events that might occur at the end of the round. For example, as it says here, your window has two spaces marked with this star symbol. We see these here and here. And this explains that at the end of a round where every player has filled in their starred spaces, you stop and open envelope M. You'll find this marked envelope in the box, and you would take it out at this point. Now be aware, opening this envelope is going to reveal some spoilers, but I'm going to keep many of the contents a secret and just show you a few essential things to be aware of. When you open an envelope, you'll find some story details printed here that should be read out loud to the group. You then remove the contents of the envelope and follow all of the printed instructions found on the inside here. Sometimes the envelope contents will include rule stickers like we see here. You peel and stick these into the rule book, into the spaces indicated at the bottom of each sticker. And then these new rules will be in effect for the rest of the campaign, unless you're told otherwise. The other contents of this envelope I'll leave for you to discover when you play, so I won't ruin any surprises I don't have to. That said, rounds will continue until the 12th round has been marked off on your window sheet, and then it's time to resolve the end of the game. Here you go to the main deck and draw the outro story card, flipping it over and reading it aloud, resolving the steps shown at the bottom in their printed order. So first, we score window one. Here you write the points you've scored from each of the three public objectives into these related spaces of your journal. You then reveal your private objective and record the points you earn from that into this space. Also total all of the unmarked points above your tools adding that value here. Then count up all of the broken or unfilled spaces of your window and score minus one point for each which you enter here. 
you then record the grand total in this final box. Now transfer that total to this box at the bottom of your Windows page and record your placement compared to the scores of the other players. For example, in our three-player game, you'll either have scored first, second, or third. And you'd record those values in these spaces. If there's a tie, then break the tie in favor of the player with the fewest legacy points. However, no one has any legacy points yet. So that means there's still a tie in this case, and we have to look at another tiebreaker. You next break ties in favor of the player with the fewest broken and empty window spaces. If still tied, break in favor of the player who scored the most points from their private objective. And if still tied, by the player order in the last round of the game, going from the first player down to the last. Once the placements have been recorded, the outro now tells the players to unlock envelope N. Again, to avoid spoilers, I'm not going to show you what's in here. But how its contents are used will be explained inside the envelope like we saw before. Next, though, we're told to continue to rewards. You'll find these steps detailed here at the back of your journal, so each player turns here now. I should also point out, you'll find a full summary of the game rules on this page, which can be helpful when you're first playing. To begin claiming rewards, the person who placed first for their window score now earns the number of these legacy stars next to the window that was just completed. For the first game, that's window number one, so they'd earn one legacy star. The first place score for the next game will earn two legacy stars, and so on. Record your legacy points by filling in that number of stars on this legacy track of your journal here. Next, you refer to this chart and earn the rewards from the row for your number of players based on how you placed. For example, in our three-player game, the first place finisher also gains this pen reward. This allows them to record their name on the back of the cathedral board in the row matching the window that they just played. Coming back to our chart, we see that the second place winner also gains a legacy star and one tool represented by this symbol. Skipping to the third place position, we see that they gain two tools. To resolve tool rewards from the main deck, find the tool cards that have this back with a value at the top matching the window that you just completed. So we collect all of these tool cards in this case. Starting with the last place player and going backwards, each person can go through these tools and collect a number of them equal to the tool symbols they earned as part of their rewards. So this means the player who came in first won't be gaining any tools. But our third place player will gain any two, and second place gains any one. Just be aware, each player may only have one copy of any particular tool. Any leftover tools are placed into this green market box, but if you have a two-player game, only one copy of a tool can go into this box. So if we had a two-player game and there were duplicates left over, send the extras to this red discard box. We'll see how these extra tool cards can be used in future games in just a moment, but for now, let's continue resolving rewards. As we see here, the second and third place players in our game each receive a certain number of these symbols representing coins. So the second place person gains one coin, and third place gains three. Coins do not carry over from game to game. You either spend all of them now or lose any you have left over. And you start with the player who has the fewest legacy points. Now, if there's a tie for legacy points, unlike earlier, when we were trying to determine placement for the windows, you don't go through those other steps to break the tie. In all other cases in the game, just to be clear, if you ever need to break a tie for most legacy points, you break the tie in favor of the person who placed higher for the just completed window. If you have to break a tie for the fewest legacy points, as we do right now, you break it in favor of the person who placed lowest for the just completed window. Either way, the player spending their coins does this at the market shown at the back of their journal. And for each coin spent, they cross off the leftmost empty space of any combination of these three tracks. And if a space they cross off has a symbol, they gain that related reward. For example, if you cross off this space, you gain a legacy star. If you cross off one of these symbols, you gain a family crest ability. Family crest abilities are something you'll learn about after opening one of the secret envelopes, so I'll leave that for you to discover then. If you cross off one of these tool symbols, gain any one tool from the market box that you don't already own. And at most, you can gain two new tools from the market per game. 
If you end up crossing off a final space on any of the three tracks, you then mark the smaller box just under the related row and resolve the related effect that's printed there. Now, in addition to spending coins at this market, you may also spend them here on the inside cover of your journal. We'll learn about the benefits of your toolbox capacity in a moment, but to expand your toolbox, you must pay the coins showing in the leftmost outlined space here, and then you color that space in. Once players have finished spending their coins, the reward step is over, and it's time to complete the cleanup step. First, put all the story cards and private objectives from the current window at the back of the main deck. These won't be used again. Then each player names their masterpiece, writing it here, and may also record it on the inside cover of their journal in the matching valued window space here. You can now start the next game by continuing to the next window in your journal and drawing the first card from the main box for window number two. Or instead, you can store everything and take a break until you're ready for the next time you want to play. The steps for pausing your campaign are all listed here for when you need to use them, and you can pause the video to read this if you're curious about how saving the campaign works. That said, here are a couple of things to keep in mind when setting up future games. In addition to the steps we learned previously, you also take any stickers out of this sticker box that you might have been instructed to store here previously. Any items you have stored in your journal's storage pouch are also removed and set near you for use while playing. For example, you might have some tool cards that you acquired previously. These are tools you can use in addition to any that might be printed on the current game page of your journal. At the start of the game, you count how many total tool cards you own and record that number in this top box, which will be added to your final window score at the end of the game. No matter how many tool cards you recorded, you now check your toolbox capacity shown here, and you start with a capacity of two. Each additional box that you fill in increases your capacity by one. You must now choose which tools to bring into the current game, and you may not exceed your current toolbox limit. So at most, I can only choose two. Any unchosen tools you have are set aside for now. They will not be used in the current game. Tool cards have a few extra rules related to their use, but you'll discover those in the secret envelopes you'll open as you play. Also, in your second and all future games, the start player is chosen by the person who has the fewest legacy points, breaking ties, if any, as we discussed earlier, which you'll remember is based on placement from the previous game. That player can then choose themselves or any other player to begin giving them the sharpener. You then play the next game, following any new rules as they get introduced. And once you've completed the 10th game of the campaign, the campaign will end and you'll resolve the end of campaign steps found on the back of the rulebook where the player with the most legacy points filled into their journal will be crowned the winner. But even then, there's still more game to be played. Included in the box, you'll find this booster pad and the related rules that will give you additional windows to play and enjoy but those rules I'll leave for you to discover on your own. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Sagrada Artisans. Now with a game that has so many hidden parts, there's always the chance that some printing errors might creep in and if any are found, those will be addressed in the online errata the publisher has created, which you'll find linked in the description of this video. Questions you might have about aspects and future games that we didn't cover in this video should be directed to the publisher. But if you have any questions about anything you did see here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.